This is a CBS News special report. I'm Nora O'Donnell in Washington, and we are coming on the air because President Biden is about to deliver remarks from the White House. We are told by officials there that the content of those remarks will deal with the Middle East. This comes just days after munitions experts tell CBS News that Israel used a U.S.-made bomb in a strike on Rafah that killed dozens while targeting Hamas leaders. Now, Israel and Hamas have been at war for 238 days since Hamas-led militants killed around 1,200 people and abducted hundreds of others in the October 7th attack last year. Since then, the Gaza Health Ministry says more than 36,000 people have been killed as a result of Israel's invasion into Gaza. This is the first opportunity also for President Biden to publicly address former President Trump's historic New York criminal conviction. We already heard from former President Trump earlier today in a rambling speech that was full of grievance and full of untruths, in which he said alarmingly, quote, we're living in a fascist state. So while there appears to have been some developments in the Middle East that the president may comment on today, we do expect, too, that he will likely comment on his expected opponent in this race, and that is Donald Trump, who is the presumptive Republican nominee. I am joined by our chief Washington correspondent, Major Garrett, as well as our chief foreign correspondent, uh, Margaret Brennan. And, uh, Margaret, you follow so closely what's happening in the world. Israel did admit that it has a ground operation underway in Rafah. Does that violate a red line for President Biden? That's the key question. The president has been completely unclear as to what a full-scale ground invasion would look like for him. Eyewitnesses have told CBS that there are tanks on the ground. Uh, what we also know is we're eight months into a conflict that at has killed more civilians than terrorists, according to the Israeli prime minister. Hamas is coming back in areas the Israeli military claims to have cleared. The secretary of state said just yesterday uh, that the Israeli government needs to be warned that they may soon face a fate worse than Hamas, quote unquote, jihadis. All this, while at least 120 hostages remain held by Hamas or affiliated groups, five of them U.S. citizens. The president has uh, had his CIA director, his national security advisor, working to try to secure secure their release alongside a ceasefire of conflict, as you know, Nora, that has had domestic implications here with protests uh, across college campuses and, as we see in our CBS polling, upset in particular among key groups that historically have been supportive of the president. And, Major, also, this is the first time that we may hear from right. President Biden on camera since of this historic conviction in New York. Symbolism and substance going on simultaneously, Nora. The substance is the presidency goes on, the president is governing and will make remarks on an ongoing international conflict of significant import for the United States and all its regional allies, but also will wade into this controversy, which he has tried to stay away from as best as humanly possible. Meeting even though, Trump's legal problems. Meeting Trump's legal problems, even though the former president argues with zero foundation that Biden is directing this and he's responsible for it. He's not, but the, but the president has tried to stay away from it. Now he will have a chance to render some statement for the country about what it all might mean. Just checking this afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon. Before I begin my remarks, I just want to say a few words about what happened yesterday in New York City. The American principle that no one is above the law was reaffirmed. Donald Trump was given every opportunity to defend himself. It was a state case, not a federal case. And it was heard by a jury of 12 citizens, 12 Americans, 12 people like you, like millions of Americans who served on juries. This jury is chosen the same way every jury in America is chosen. It was a process that Donald Trump's attorney was part of. The jury heard five weeks of evidence, five weeks. And after careful deliberation, the jury reached a unanimous verdict. They found Donald Trump guilty on all 34 felony counts. Now he'll be given the opportunity, as he should, to appeal that decision, just like everyone else has that opportunity. That's how the American system of justice works. And it's reckless, it's dangerous, it's irresponsible for anyone to say this was rigged just because they don't like the verdict. 
Our justice system has endured for nearly 250 years. And it literally is the cornerstone of America, our justice system. The justice system should be respected, and we should never allow anyone to tear it down. It's as simple as that. That's America. That's who we are. And that's who we'll always be, God willing. Now to another issue. I, uh, I want to give an update on my efforts to end the crisis in Gaza. For the past several months, my negotiators of foreign policy, intelligence community, and like have been relentlessly focused, not just on a ceasefire that would, ever, that would inevitably be fragile and temporary, but on a durable end of the war. That's been the focus, a durable end of this war, one that brings all the hostages home, ensures Israel's security, creates a better day after in Gaza without Hamas in power, and sets the stage for political settlement that provides a better future for Israelis and Palestinians alike. Now, after intensive diplomacy carried out by my team, and my many conversations with leaders of Israel, Qatar, and Egypt, and other Middle Eastern countries, Israel has now offered, Israel has offered a comprehensive new proposal. It's a roadmap to an enduring ceasefire and the release of all hostages. This proposal has been transmitted by Qatar to Hamas. Today, I want to lay out its terms for the American citizens and for the world. This new proposal has three phases, three. The first phase would last for six weeks. Here's what it would include, a full and complete ceasefire, a withdrawal of Israeli forces from all populated areas of Gaza, release of a number of hostages, including women, the elderly, the wounded, in exchange for release of hundreds of Palestinian prisoners. There are American hostages who would be released at this stage, and we want them home. Additional sum remains of hostages who have been killed would be returned to their families, bringing some degree of closure to that terrible grief. Palestinians, civilians would return to their homes and neighborhoods in all areas of Gaza including in the north. Humanitarian assistance would surge, with 600 trucks carrying aid into Gaza every single day. With the ceasefire, that aid could be safely and effectively distributed to all who need it. Hundreds of thousands of temporary shelters, including housing units, would be delivered by the international community. All that and more would begin immediately immediately. During the six weeks of, of phase one, Israel and Hamas would negotiate the necessary arrangements to get to phase two, which is a permanent end to hostilities. Now, I'll be straight with you. There are a number of details to negotiate to move from phase one to phase two. Israel will want to make sure its interests are protected. But the proposal says, if the negotiations take longer than six weeks from phase one, the ceasefire will still continue as long as negotiations continue. In the United States, Egypt and Qatar would work to ensure negotiations keep going. All agreements, all agreements, until all the agreements are reached and phase two is able to begin. Then phase two, there would be an exchange for the release of all remaining living hostages including male soldiers, Israeli forces would withdraw from Gaza. And as long as the mosque lives up to its commitments, a temporary ceasefire would become, in the words of the, proposed, the Israeli proposal, the cessation of hostilities permanently, end of quote. Cessation of hostilities permanently. Finally, in phase three, a major reconstruction plan for, Ga for Gaza would, would commence. And any final remains of hostages who've been killed, would be returned to their families. That's the offer that's now on the table and what we've been asking for. It's what we need. The people of Israel should know they can make this offer without any further risk to their own security because they've devastated Hamas forma, uh, forces over the past eight months. 
At this point, Hamas no longer is capable of carrying out another October 7th, which is one of the Israel's main objectives in this war, and quite frankly, a righteous one. I know there are those in Israel who will not agree with this plan and will call for the war to continue indefinitely. Some, some are even in the government coalition, and they've made it clear they want to occupy Gaza, they want to keep fighting for years, and the hostages are not a priority to them. Well, I've urged the leadership in Israel to stand behind this deal, despite whatever pressure comes. And to the people of Israel, let me say this. As someone who's had a lifelong commitment to Israel, as the only American president who's ever gone to Israel in a time of war, as someone who just sent the U.S. forces to directly defend Israel when it was attacked by Iran, I ask you to take a step back and think of what will happen if this moment is lost. We can't lose this moment. Indefinite war in pursuit of an unidentified notion of total victory will not bring Israel in, will not bring down, bog down, will only bog down Israel and Gaza. Draining the economic, military, and human, and human resources, and furthering Israel's isolation in the world. That will not bring hostages home. That will not, not bring an enduring defeat of Hamas. That will not bring Israel lasting security. But a comprehensive approach that starts with this deal will bring hostages home and will lead to more secure Israel. And once a ceasefire and hostage deal is concluded, it unlocks the possibility of a great deal more progress, including, including calm along Israel's northern border with Lebanon. The United States will help forge a diplomatic resolution, one that ensures Israel's security and allows people to safely return to their homes without fear of being attacked. With the deal, a rebuilding of Gaza will begin. Arab nations and the international community, along with Palestinian and Israeli leaders, to get it done in a manner that does not allow Hamas to rearm. And the United States will work with our partners to rebuild homes, schools, and hospitals in Gaza, to help repair communities that were destroyed in the chaos of war. And with this deal, Israel could become more deeply integrated in the region, including, it's no surprise to you all, including no uh, potential historic normalization agreement with Saudi Arabia. Israel could be part of a regional security network to counter the threat posed by Iran. All this progress would make Israel more secure, with Israeli families no longer living in the shadow of a terrorist attack. And all this would create the conditions for a different future, a better future for the Palestinian people, one of self-determination, dignity, security, and freedom. This path is available once the deal is struck. <clears throat> Israel will always have the right to defend itself against the threats to its security and to bring those responsible October 7th to justice. And the United States will always ensure that Israel has what it needs to defend itself. If Hamas fails to fulfill its commitments under the deal, Israel can resume military operations. But Egypt and Qatar have assured me, and they are continuing to work to ensure that Hamas doesn't do that. And the United States will help ensure that Israel lives up to their obligations as well. That's what this deal says. That's what it says. And we'll do our part. This is truly a decisive moment. Israel has made their proposal. Hamas says it wants to cease fire. This deal is an opportunity to prove whether they really mean it. Hamas needs to take the deal. For months, people all over the world have called for ceasefire. Now it's time to raise your voices and demand that Hamas come to the table, agrees to this deal, and ends this war that they began. Of course, there'll be differences on the specific details that need to be worked out. That's natural. If Hamas comes to negotiate ready to deal, then Israel negotiations must be given a mandate 
the necessary flexibility to close that deal. The past eight months have marked heartbreaking pain. Pain of those whose loved ones are slaughtered by Hamas terrorists on October 7th. Hostages and their families waiting in anguish. Ordinary Israelis whose lives were forever marked by the shattering event of Hamas's sexual violence and ruthless brutality. And the Palestinian people have endured sheer hell in this war. Too many innocent people have been killed, including thousands of children. Far too many have been badly wounded. We all saw the terrible images from the deadly fire in Rafah earlier this week following an Israeli strike against targeting Hamas. And even as we work to surge assistance to Gaza, with 1,800 trucks delivering supplies these last five days, 1,800, the humanitarian crisis still remains. I know this is a subject on which people in this country feel deep, passionate convictions, and so do I. This has been one of the hardest, most complicated problems in the world. There's nothing easy about this, nothing easy about it. Through it all, though, the United States has worked relentlessly to support Israeli security, to get humanitarian supplies into Gaza, to get a ceasefire and a hostage deal to bring this war to an end. Yesterday, with this new initiative, we've taken an important step in that direction. I want to level with you today as to where we are and what might be possible. But I need your help. Everyone who wants peace now must raise their voices and let the leaders know they should take this deal, work to make it real, make it lasting, and forge a better future out of the tragic terror attack and war. It's time to begin this new stage for the hostages to come home, for Israel to be secure, for the suffering to stop. It's time for this war to end, for the day after to begin. Thank you very much. Donald Trump refers to himself as a political prisoner and blames you directly. What's your response to that, sir? Well, done. well, there you have it, a significant set of remarks from the president of the United States and the commander in chief. I say that there are two different things. One, of course, he talked and responded uh, to what has happened in New York City and the historic conviction of former President Donald Trump and his likely opponent in this upcoming election, where he talked about the American principle that no one is above the law, and then said clearly, it's reckless, dangerous, irresponsible to say that this was rigged just because someone doesn't like the outcome. Also, there is big news on a new initiative, what he calls, in the Middle East to try and end this war. We're going to break it all down. I want to go first to our senior White House and political correspondent, Ed O'Keefe, who is at the White House, and Ed, a significant set of remarks, as I said, from the president today. Yeah, one of the newsiest ones he's had in a while, because it allowed him to respond to what happened yesterday, but then use the trappings of his office to convey to the world that he's doing the day job. And that's exactly how his campaign wants it, that here he is dealing with something of grave global importance, while his opponent said what he said this morning, accusing the sitting president once again of being responsible for the prosecution he faced in New York um, and, and, you know, and, and is guilty. And, and that idea that, that the American principle that no one is above the law is reaffirmed is the sort of institutional message that the president wants to send um, and by speaking out today, in, in essence, is trying to, to hold firm to. But uh, it, is, it is notable. Uh, it is, to those of us who cover him, frustrating that he, as you saw there, declined to engage a little more and address the accusations made by his anticipated opponent that he was personally responsible for this prosecution, which there is no evidence that he was. The other notable thing from those remarks regarding the Middle East, at least to this year, was the fact that he called on protesters who've been in the streets for months criticizing the president's support for Israel to say, if you're really for a ceasefire, 
Now turn your attention to the leaders of Hamas and urge them to take this deal. In essence, trying to take the public anger, not only in this country, but around the world, and have it redirected toward leadership of Hamas. And he says that just days before he's headed to Europe, where he's likely to be confronted by leaders, uh, but also potentially in the streets of France, where he'll go first and then Italy, uh, over American support for the conflict. But again, uh, an, an opportunity today for a president who is running even or slightly behind his opponent, Donald Trump, to respond to that uh, and to then deal with a, a matter of, of you know, foreign policy importance, yeah. Nora. Ed O'Keefe, uh, thank you. I want to turn to our chief foreign correspondent, um, foreign affairs correspondent, Margaret Brennan. And Margaret, um, you follow this so closely. How much of a new development uh, is this in terms of this new Israeli proposal? Well, it's the very first time I've heard the president of the United States say it is time for this war to end, some eight months into this extremely bloody conflict. It's also key the time of day, 145 here on the East Coast. It is well into the evening on a Friday night in Israel. Um, for those observing, there will be restrictions on their ability to come out publicly and comment on this. Um, there will also be, as we have seen in Israel, nearly every weekend of this conflict, protests against the Netanyahu government urging them to bring home the hostages through diplomacy versus through war. Uh, but in terms of what the, the president laid out here today, he laid out this chessboard of here's the three phases to bring the hostages home. For the first time, he was linking a short-term pause of six weeks cessation and violence to a broader end to the conflict that he says the Israelis are open to at this point. We know the CIA director met with the head of Mossad just last Friday in Paris, uh, then also said once we get to the end of this, we can talk about Israelis returning to their homes in the north of the country. This is a huge political issue back in Israel right now, because on, on that conflict with uh, Hezbollah in north Lebanon, people have had to flee their homes and haven't been able to go back. Uh, and he also spoke to that broader promise to Benjamin Netanyahu, the embattled prime minister, and we might be able to get you a peace deal with Saudi Arabia. He is dangling a lot of carrots out there to a politically embattled leader and really uh, gestured to the pressure that's on the Israeli prime minister from the far right of his party, saying there's some we know in your government who don't want this war to end. But it also seemed very clear, too, that the president was laying out that Israel has come to a deal that was transmitted by the Qataris to Hamas, that mm -hmm. this ball is now in Hamas's court, and that that's where not only he wants it, the solution to be found or perhaps negotiated, but also, I think, to put the pressure back on Hamas, Hamas in the eyes of the world. Yes, he was doing that, as Ed laid out there, absolutely. I, I'm drawing the distinction between what the Israeli intelligence apparatus has been able to agree to with the United States versus the political decisions made by the prime minister. And sometimes those things have been in conflict and Biden officials have been very frustrated with that. And absent from the president's formal remarks was a direct reference to Benjamin Netanyahu, the Israeli prime minister, supporting this and carrying this forward under his auspices, even with a divided cabinet. Mm. This is a proposal. It is not a deal. Mm -hmm. And proposals, as Margaret and you and I know in the Middle East live forever, but they are hard to achieve. Lots of proposals come and go in the Middle East. With there the are US three phases for decades here. leading for decades. the effort to bring peace to there the There are Middle three East. phases to this, but there is only one practical phase. If this isn't agreed to as far as a cessation of hostility, withdrawing of Israeli forces, putting back of some of the hostages, there is no phase two and phase three. Mm -hmm. And absent that declaration from the president that I've talked to Bibi Netanyahu, he supports this and we do this together, there is some curiosity I have about how devoted Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is to this particular proposal and if it is entirely in Hamas's hands to decide whether or not this becomes a deal which transforms it from a proposal to something that they both sides can work on. It's excellent analysis. Can I also get your take, Major, on what the president said about Donald Trump? And Donald Trump's comments that this whole uh, conviction and trial was rigged and Donald Trump's efforts to undermine the American judicial system. Yes, President Trump said that. That doesn't make it true. And as the president pointed out, every opportunity to, through due process, defend yourself, question jurors, apply the evidence to scrutiny was given to that defendant, the former president, who's now a convicted felon, period.
And I thought it was interesting the president also said he can appeal this. Go he ahead. He can go back to the court. You have every right, but as every American does. But it's dangerous to say this is rigged. That is not just Donald Trump. That is a number of elected Republican officials who have come out with statements questioning the judicial system in this country. Because as uh, President Biden said, our justice system is the cornerstone of America, and we should never allow anyone to tear it down. Our coverage will continue on CBS News 24-7, your local news. And we're going to have a full wrap-up and more analysis tonight on the CBS Evening News. This has been a CBS News special report. I'm Nora O'Donnell.